happy new year. It's 2024. Can you believe it? New year. Same us, same Red Planet Live. We are kicking off this year with an awesome guest. And so I want to uh, welcome everyone to Red Planet Live. I am your host, Ashton Zeth, and I am elated to be hosting the Mars Society's podcast and leading the conversation about human exploration of the universe uh, and the future settlement of Mars. As a longtime space enthusiast, I am passionate about STEM education and making humanity an interplanetary species. So thank you everyone for being here today and supporting Red Planet Live. So like I said, we are kicking off January 2024 with an awesome guest. Dr. Graham Lau, also known as the Cosmobiologist, serves as Director of Communications and Research Investigator at Blue Marble Space Institute of Space, as well as uh, Director of Logistics for the Mars Society's University Rover Challenge, which is held annually at our Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. In addition, he is also the host of the prominent online show, Ask an Astrobiologist, which is sponsored by the NASA Astrobiology Program and Saganet. Welcome, Dr. Graham Lau. It's a pleasure to have you here on RPL. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to join. My, my son is over here on the sidelines also making some sounds, so you'll hear from him as well, I think. Um, but it is a huge pleasure to join for Red Planet Live again. Yeah, excited to, to see you. and. Thank you. Uh, like I said, coming on, and and that's okay. We we love having some some surprise guests on there. So if yeah, if we hear Nolan in the background, he's just having some fun. Um, but before we kick off the conversation uh, with Dr. Lau, I want to remind everyone that the Mars Society has launched its crowdfunding campaign for the Mars Technology Institute, also known as MTI. We know that settling Mars will require dramatic advances in biotech, artificial intelligence, advanced energy, as well as many other areas of research. MTI will develop these technologies and commercialize them for use on Earth. So if successful, the ultimate goal is to create a network of new technology companies with collectively both the know-how and the financial power to enable the human settlement of the Red Planet. MTI is a 501c3 nonprofit org that will raise its initial uh, capital by donations, all of which are tax deductible. And so that's where we need your help. There are varying uh, levels of donation and each level includes giving perks. Uh, that includes an MTI supporter patch, annual Mars Society membership, an autographed copy of President Dr. Robert Zubrin's next book, The New World on Mars. Uh, there's also an MTI Pioneer medal medallion, a founder's plaque. You're gonna get a, a perk at every level. So contributing the maximum donation and in addition to the previously mentioned items, you will uh, be given a pro rata invitation to participate in first round private placement stock offerings of any MTI spinoff companies. Every donation fuels our mission to advance space exploration and technology. The Mars Society has a proven track record of pioneering innovations for Mars missions. Join us in making a difference. For more information and to donate, go to marstechnology.institute. All right, so here we go. Let's kick it off. Uh, as you know, we are going to start today's episode like every episode on RPL. I do a segment called Question of the Day. So this is just meant to be our icebreaker. It's fun. No right or wrong answer. Uh, I just want to hear your opinion. So today's Question of the Day is inspired by... Dr. Lau, your Instagram, uh, between the science content, the nerdy memes, the inspirational quotes, all of which I've loved, uh, I noticed that you have a dedication to fitness, health, meditation. So today's question is, what is your favorite way to stay physically fit and in good health? Oh my, that's a huge question. Since I do a lot of different things to stay fit and to keep myself in good health, I, I think for all of us, some level of physical exercise is crucial to maintain our health as we get older, especially. There's mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of research out there showing that resistance training, for instance, is really important. As you get older, especially folks over 60 years old, uh, some resistance training every week is really helpful to maintain bone density, um, to maintain your muscle, um, and overall the coordination, balance. There's so many things that are important about it. When it comes to my own personal fitness, I, I not only hit the gym and use my rowing machine, I'm also into yoga and meditation, as you mentioned. I also love hiking and snowshoeing and getting outdoors as much as possible. I think really having some kind of well-rounded approach, no matter what people are doing for their own physical fitness, for their own physical being, is, is necessary. Having some way of, of training your mind, training you know your spirit, your essence, however you choose to view that, uh, and having a way of training your body and pushing yourself a little bit sometimes as well, pushing up against some of your limits. 
Um, you don't have to go out and run an ultra marathon and, and you know do a David Goggins and run 200 miles or or go out and try to be the, the heaviest bench presser or deadlifter or anything on the planet. But I, I think it's important for us all to explore what our own bodies can and can't do and to know how to safely push our own limits. All right. So a little bit of everything. I like that. And last time we talked, you had your jujitsu shirt on and, and that was pretty fun as well. So uh, I love that. Myself, I went very little here, literal here. Uh, spin. If I'm not weightlifting or strength training, I love going to a cycle studio. I love the community atmosphere and, you know, really what it comes down to with the dark room, the lasers, the loud music, it's really just like an adult version of going to the club. So like exercise, have fun, good music at the same time. Uh, that's, that's the way that I like to, to work out and try to stay fit. So, you know, I've seen lots of cool videos on like Instagram reels of like cycle bars and these people yeah. doing like their spin classes and dancing and I haven't done it yet. Maybe I should. You should check it out. It's intense. I, I'll say that for sure. Um, but yeah, I love the like community atmosphere and you've got, um, you know, an instructor that's always pushing you. It's nice to do a mix of, you know, spin classes and then like traditional weightlifting, which is usually one-on-one -on -one, or maybe you've got a, a partner that that's going to be spotting you, but it's nice to get a mix of the, the two very solo versus class atmosphere. And like I said, it's loud, lots of good music, good energy. Uh, it's a good way to, to stress relief. So I recommend it. All right, here we go. Uh, reminder to everybody that's tuning in today, if you have a question, please submit those um, in the chat. I'll try to get to those throughout our, our conversation today, but want to utilize as much of our time together and, and let's just dive right into some questions. Um, I wanted to start uh, when I was preparing for our conversation. I was watching some of your, your videos and I checked out a recent episode of Ask an Astrobiologist. Uh, this one was particularly with uh, Dr. Adam Frank and the topic of the Drake equation came up. And I love that because um, my dad has a Drake uh, equation tattoo on his arm. Um, so that was fun to, to hear you guys talk about that. So for those that are unfamiliar, can you explain what the Drake equation is and why it's important to astrobiology? Yeah, absolutely. And, and having Adam on the show was really awesome. He's He's got a new book out called The Little Book of Aliens and does a lot of really cool conceptual things in astrobiology. And, and really the Drake equation is one of the most important conceptual ideas so far from astrobiology and one of the most impactful for our thinking about space exploration, how astrobiology impacts us now, the future of our species. The Drake equation was formulated by, by Frank Drake, the astronomer, and he, he was quite young when he created it. This is back in the 1960s. Uh, Drake just passed away a few years ago now. Uh, so over 60 years ago, uh, Drake came up with this equation. And, and originally he was actually, it was, it was the syllabus or the outline of a conference he was planning uh, at the new, uh, then new, now it's you know many decades old, the, the Green, Bank, uh, Green Bank Observatory in Virginia. Um, and he had to create a meeting uh, synopsis of what do we need to know right now to find out how many alien civilizations are out there who might be trying to communicate with us via radio. And that was the question. And so they brought in a bunch of thinkers from radio astronomy, uh, a very young Carl Sagan joined the group. Um, there were people involved in different realms of how we might understand if aliens exist and whether or not they can communicate. And so the equation, uh, the output of the equation is this, this big capital N, uh, the number of civilizations that can communicate right now. And the, civiliza the, 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 the equation is really interesting because it's more of a thought experiment. It's not one that we can have any numbers for. So whenever you hear in the news, like every couple of years, it's announced like some astronomer has an exact number for the, the Drake equation. I remember a few years ago, there was this claim of 37 civilizations because they have some new numbers. Um, flat, wrong. There, we, we cannot answer the Drake equation right now. We're not meant to right now. It's a guidepost. It's, it's a, a thought experiment about what we do and don't know about alien life. And so the equation starts off with the rate of star formation in our galaxy at a given time. Uh, so, something that we actually know quite well right now. We actually have a really good idea of, of roughly how many stars are forming in a given year right now in our, in our galaxy. Um, and then from that very large number, we start factoring that large number down uh, with small factors. And so for all the stars out there, you consider how many stars have planets. Of those stars, uh, how many of those planets have life? Um, of those, how many have developed intelligent, uh, intelligence, and of those, how many have communication? And you start kind of like whittling down from this very large number down to a number of civilizations out there that, that can communicate. 
And my favorite part of the Drake equation is the very end of it. It's called the L factor. Um, that, that helps to take out that little uh, per year unit. Uh, the L factor is the life, lifetime of a civilization. It's how old civilizations tend to be on average. The really cool thing about that, one, we have no idea what that number is. Uh, right. We know that for us, it's 10,000 or so right now. And it might be even bigger if we're fortunate and we persist through a lot of the potential disasters we can foresee right now, uh, not just outside disasters like aliens invading and killing us or a giant rock from space destroying our planet um, or even like a ma major solar flare or something. Um, but we also have other existential threats that we're creating for ourselves and how we've impacted our planet in the way that we've poised ourselves, specifically with nuclear weapons. Uh, so in 1960, in the early 1960s, it was very apparent around the world that we were we were very prepared to destroy ourselves through a nuclear war, specifically between the U.S. and the USSR back then. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're still in that place now. We still have a large number of nuclear warheads around the planet that could obliterate our society tomorrow. Uh, and so the L factor is really important in the Drake equation. It helps us also frame our thinking of what alien civilizations might be like. Are they also facing bottlenecks? Uh, do they also face this need to become multiplanetary and go out into their own star systems and to other star systems and start populating other worlds to have some kind of fallback and some way of, of moving their civilization forward? And so the Drake equation is, is really important for our thinking, not only about what we do and don't know about alien life, but also what we don't really know right now about our own future. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, speaking of things we don't know, possibilities for life. Let's talk about Mars, the, the topic that everybody want, wants to talk about and the reason that we are here. Um, let's talk about Mars and potentially, you know, the, the chances of life. Um, you know, I, I was curious to hear your thoughts about uh, the NASA Mars sample return um, and the likelihood that scientists will potentially find some kind of current extinct life in those samples. Um, and on top of that, in addition to your thoughts about what, what is the likelihood there, um, you know, is there any actual risk in bringing those samples back? How could this potentially go wrong getting those samples back to Earth? Yeah, lots of things to unpack there. Let's start off with Mars and the potential for life. Um, those who are watching who've seen me speak elsewhere, I, I already see there's a few of those people here, um, know that I, I actually think Venus was the more likely candidate for life in our early solar system more so than Mars. Hold on a second, yeah. Please, okay, it's okay, go over there. I love you, buddy. Um, that's my little boy here. Um, but yeah, I, I think Venus was more likely to have life early in our solar system than Mars, given the dynamics of where Venus is. It's much more like the Earth. But we're learning more and more that early Mars had a lot of water. It likely had a far more clement uh, atmosphere and surface environment. Clement meaning it had better temperatures for life as we know it to thrive. Um, it likely had a denser atmosphere that has long since been slowly stripped away, uh, mostly removed due to uh, impact by solar radiation, kind of just slowly ablating away or uh, sp uh, spalling away the atmospheric material. But early on, Mars might have been habitable and potentially inhabited. Um, even for those who follow the idea of panspermia, this concept that life could transition between worlds, um, it's even possible that maybe we are Martians, maybe life started there and came here early on or, or from Venus even. Um, and so I do think that there was a very good likelihood of possible life on early Mars. I think if life persisted there during the changes that happened, and a lot of those changes happened very early on in Mars's history, it lost its atmosphere, it, it lost its surface water a very, very long time ago. Uh, I think if life had been there, it most likely would have, would have been forced to find what we call refugia, uh, refuges, places where it could still thrive in that kind of environment. And so for me, I think the most hopeful place for finding signs of past or even maybe present life on Mars is rather deep in the subsurface. I think deep down below where the radiation is bombarding the surface, where you have cold temperatures and almost no atmosphere, there's a, a likelihood down there, I think, of finding very good signs of life. So that said, um, NASA's Mars Sample Return Program. Those watching who are who are following what's going on in the space industry and space exploration, they might know that right now it's not looking likely that MSR, at least as it had been planned originally, is going to go forward. There's a lot of issues with funding, uh, with getting congressional support to allow us to go pick up those samples. 
um, because the current idea of Mars sample return doesn't really fit like the overall scheme of let's go to Mars, get some samples and bring them back. It fits a scheme where we've already sent a rover to Mars, Perseverance, with this capability of caching samples, and we, we've cached a large number of them already. Mm -hmm. And now the idea is to bring those samples back to Earth, which when that was first proposed, we knew you know, early on, we knew that it would require a large architecture to be developed to send another spacecraft that can go with some kind of rover or collector to collect those samples, yep. Yep. launch them into orbit. And then there's this idea of building yet another, as of, as of yet undeveloped spacecraft to go and collect those samples from orbit of Mars, bring them back to Earth, and then somehow you know, getting those samples down to the surface of Earth and getting to a very well-regulated, safe environment for opening the samples up and looking at them. Mm -hmm. um, because then there's that last question of, of how safe is it to bring samples back from Mars? But when it comes to the Mars sample return architecture, it is it is a very large undertaking and one that is is maybe politically not very favored right now. And so we're not quite sure right now, I think, what the future of MSR is through NASA. But on the whole, I think it's really important for us to eventually bring some samples back from Mars to look not just for signs of life, but I'm, I'm also a geologist. My background's in geochemistry. And there's also just so much we can learn about Mars in general from samples that are returned. Uh, we can only do so much with our rovers. Our, our rovers, you know, they're cutting edge robots that we send there with the top of the line space ready instruments. But even those are still very limited in resolution and what we can really do with them. If we have a sample here on Earth, we can take it into a lab and we can, we can dice it apart in many different ways and use a lot of different instruments to look at it at very high resolution. There's so much more we can do with samples that are returned from Mars to Earth. Okay. Yeah, we, we had talked a little bit about that and some of the other things that are, you know, happening in the news that we've heard about with, with NASA. And so it's, you know, the plan is, doesn't always go as it's planned. Uh, things change, you have to adapt. Uh, sounds like that is happening on on a few different projects and, and missions um, within NASA. Obviously, we we talked about um, and have heard about the delay to Artemis sending the next crew uh, to the moon. You know, that is what it is. Safety is always paramount. That's the priority. We want to get those astronauts there and have them come back. So you know, hey, if it takes a little bit longer, that is what it is for the the moment. But you said that you think Venus may have been a better option. Maybe there was life there. So let's talk about Venus. I want to talk about Saturn as well. Um, I had seen an article recently um, on space.com about speculation, possible biosignatures on the planet of Venus. Let's talk about that. Uh, let's talk about research into the um, sulfuric acid clouds of Venus. Is that a potential home for life? What, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah. So firstly, Venus is not remotely close uh, today to what it was like a long time ago. And the sad thing is we don't really fully know what Venus was like in the early solar system. Unlike Mars, you know, we, we can look back at the, at the history of Mars and, and see billions of years of Martian past in history and its geology, on surface features. We don't have that on Venus. Uh, Venus is very much Earth's twin planet. It's very similar in size, very similar in composition. Uh, it did not have the early moon forming event that we had here on the Earth that not only gave us our moon, but it's also part of why the Earth has, has such a high density. It also caused the formation of our, our inner core to be much larger. So Venus has a smaller inner core. Um, it lost its, its magnetism you know, fairly early, early on because of that. Um, but Venus in the last billion, at least you know, 500 million years, has undergone some radical changes, um, including what appears to be the entire surface of the planet melting uh, melting out. So there, there aren't many craters on the surface of Venus. Uh, and part of the reasoning for that is that the surface at one point became practically like a, a big lava sphere that then you know, recently solidified. And, uh, and then the atmosphere itself went, underwent a, a rampant runaway greenhouse effect. Um, so right now people think about, you know, you know, global climate change on the earth and the greenhouse effect and how those things happen. It wasn't until we started studying Venus that we really started to realize how rampant a uh, greenhouse effect could be if it's not controlled and that happened on venus and so venus's surface temperature is hundreds of degrees uh it's 92 times the surface pressure that we have here on the earth um you know Neil deGrasse tyson once famously calculated that you could cook one of those freezer pizzas in eight seconds on the surface of venus um, but you would be dead long before you could actually eat it because the surface is so inhospitable 
uh, even the longest lived probes that have gone to the surface from the, uh, from the USSR, the Venera 13 and 14 landers, the longest that one of them went was 127 minutes on the surface before the high temperature and the pressure destroyed it. Uh, and so the surface of Venus is not friendly for life as we know it. It might have been long ago. And there's actually really great hypotheses with some data to suggest that maybe early Venus had plate tectonics. Maybe it had oceans. Maybe it was much more like the Earth is now. Um, all of that said, there is a potential that there had been life on Venus or life has gone to Venus, perhaps from Earth rocks. Um, and if so, then maybe that life could have found itself a way to evolve and thrive in the atmosphere. Uh, this is actually a very old idea. People have been putting this forward for a long time. Carl Sagan famously wrote about the possibility for life in Venus's clouds. David Grinspoon, uh, in his book on Venus Revealed, wrote about this possibility of a, a Venusian biosphere in the, the cloud layers of Venus, roughly 51 kilometers above the surface of Venus is an area where the temperature and the pressure are almost the same as we have here on Earth at sea level. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, perfect for life as we know it to thrive. Uh, and then a few years ago, a paper came out by Jane Greaves, uh, an astronomer and her colleagues, showing that they had data from two separate uh, radio observatories here on the Earth. Uh, they had radio data um, of looking at Venus in, in radio waves. Uh, and they had data showing the potential for the existence of a molecule called phosphine. Uh, phosphine yeah. is very similar. Maybe uh, th folks can think about methane. Methane is a carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms bound to it. Phosphine is fairly similar in how it looks. It has a phosphorus in the middle uh, with three hydrogens that are bound to it. That phosphine molecule is really interesting to be present in the atmosphere of Venus. On Earth, we don't find phosphine anywhere um, naturally uh, mm -hmm. without the presence of life. So we can form phosphine in the lab easily, abiotically, without life. But anywhere we find phosphine on Earth, in the environment, it's been formed by life. Uh, famously in penguin poop, uh, in penguin guano is, is the place where it's most concentrated. We find it in bogs and swamps, areas where microbes are decaying organic matter. They can form phosphine through a metabolic pathway. And so the, the hypothesis from Jane Greaves and colleagues was maybe this phosphine is a biosignature. Maybe it's a sign of life. Members of that team had actually already proposed looking for phosphine as a biosignature on exoplanets, uh, mm -hmm. worlds around other stars. So maybe they, were, they, they thought this could be possible. Um, however, the scientific community was very quick to, to enter the debate and to, to share other information. For instance, we know that phosphine exists in the atmospheres of Saturn and Jupiter. And uh, we, we know it forms abiotically there. We have very good chemical models for how it can form without the presence of life in some systems, um, but not in Venus. Um, others have pointed out that maybe it's coming from subsurface volcanism. Uh, so volcanoes bringing up some material from the subsurface on Venus could be bringing phosphorus into the cloud layer and that could be driving the development of phosphine. There's other potentials too that maybe the phosphine really isn't there. Um, some have proposed that maybe what they're, they're seeing and they, they are interpreting as phosphine in their data is actually some of the sulfur dioxide that's in the atmosphere of Venus. And so um, it's a very interesting finding and it's one that deserves a lot more um, uh, interrogation and interpretation. But it's also one that I think really finally might get us some support for getting more missions back to Venus. Uh, even though I love Mars, I think everyone watching, you know, the Mars Society show probably loves Mars. Um, there are also other worlds to explore, and we honestly have not done that much exploration of Venus by spacecraft. And so, if anything, this phosphine finding should make us want to go back and really study that atmosphere more, and maybe even look directly for the phosphine from orbit, see if it's there, and maybe look for signs of life from orbit. That's incredible. I didn't know that. I'm I'm now intrigued. Okay, so Venus, I, I would say we need to put some some more effort there. And I will forever think of penguin poop differently now. Um, but you mentioned Saturn. So let's focus on Saturn. Uh, what's the latest news about Saturn's moon Enceladus and the chances of life uh, in the subterranean ocean? And is NASA still planning uh, an exploratory mission to Enceladus? Is that still happening? Yeah, so um, so yes, that should be happening. Um, okay. So th there's there's this uh, survey that's done by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, Mathematics, uh, NASEM. Uh, they do these surveys of various groups of scientists, various communities of scientists. Uh, they call them decadal surveys. Uh, basically, every decade, 
uh, asking researchers from across a, a community who do a bunch of different work of what things do we want to see within our field of research that are funded by government uh, taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. And so we had one recently on planetary science and astrobiology for the coming decade ahead. And one of the big things that was proposed was having a mission that would go to Enceladus, an Orbi lander. Uh, so an Orbi lander is a mixture of an orbiter and a lander together. So doing an orbital mission that goes around Enceladus, also a lander to go down and land on Enceladus as well. Um, Enceladus is very intriguing. It is a very small moon. And so a lot of folks, like they think about moons like Titan, Ganymede, Europa, our moon, those are really big moons. Uh, Enceladus is more uh, similar to the size of most of the moons of our solar system, rather small. And yet, when we, we first got to the Saturnian system with the Cassini mission, we learned right away there was these plumes of liquid water that were actually water vapor that were coming out of the southern hemisphere of Enceladus, erupting from these regions we call the Tiger Stripes, um, and blowing out into this region around Saturn, actually making Saturn's E-ring. Uh, so Enceladus makes the E-ring around Saturn. Um, it's mostly composed of water vapor and dust that kind of coagulating together um, and forming this large ring. We can't see that ring with our own eyes in visible images, but we see it with infrared and some other imagery. Um, but Enceladus, as we learned through Cassini data over time, one, we learned that it has a subsurface ocean. That subsurface ocean is likely global in extent, so it's not just a small pocket that's coming out through the tiger stripes. It's likely under the icy shell of the entire moon is this subsurface ocean. Uh, we also have some data that have led to, uh, has led to some very good speculation that there could be hydrothermal activity inside of that ocean. Uh, so on Earth's seafloor, we have hydrothermal vent systems where uh, seawater goes down into the oceanic crust. It gets warmed up by the mantle down below and comes back out and makes hydrothermal vents. We have some data to suggest that might be happening inside of Enceladus as well. Um, but then Enceladus, like if there, are, if there is potential for life in that ocean, again, it's a very small moon. And so that does give us some reason to think maybe there couldn't be life. Uh, maybe that the, the, the length of time of this venting of water uh, is only you know, limited to some, some small fraction because there might not be enough time for that, that, that whole ocean to be blowing out like that. Um, but say there is potential for life there, then we have what could be the best way to find life in our solar system blowing that, that those signs of possible life out into orbit uh, of this world. So it's, it's a really interesting world for us to study and to send uh, more missions to. Uh, Morgan Cable, a researcher at NASA's JPL, specifically, and also a very good friend of mine, has developed this really cool robot design called EELS, or Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor, to use this long snake-like or eel-like robot that could like climb down inside the tiger stripes uh, to let us really sample the material coming out of them. So I'm pretty excited for that possibility if, they, if that gets funded and sent to Enceladus. But uh, the future is always going to be grand, and there's a lot of possibility for what we can learn from that moon. Even if there's not life there, there still are great reasons to send uh, robots that can get down in the cracks and look for other things there, too. There's still so much for us to learn about that moon because of that water coming out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that's you're right. There's there's a lot to learn there, and we have some great questions. I, I've got a couple other questions about your um, you know experience with uh, University Rover Challenge, but we've got great audience questions about these samples, about finding life. So I want to do those now since we're on this topic. Uh, I see we have a question from the Astrobiology Academy, which is uh, I think this is the Mars uh, sample return related. It says if these samples wouldn't be contaminated contaminated by our Earth's life showing false positives, it would be a great risk to bring them back. What about a lab on Mars to analyze them? Good very question. cool idea. Um, I'm a proponent. Uh, I, I very much support the idea of sending humans to Mars. Uh, there's a lot more that we can do with humans on the surface of Mars than we can with our robots. I love perseverance and curiosity and opportunity and spirit and sojourner uh, and ingenuity and all the things that we've done so far in robotics for Mars. And there's a lot more we could do in the future. Uh, I envision, you know, the, the, the spot, the, the Boston Dynamics Spot rover, robot, you know, dogs, uh, dropping those via drone into some lava tubes on Mars and walking around would be very cool. But there's so much more we could do, especially if you put some geologists on Mars, there's so much that they could do. Uh, just by knowing what kinds of rocks to look for, how to really like study a sample. And if we had laboratories on Mars to do that with, even better. 
Um, I would love to see that happen. And and you're right. There's there's a lot of issues that come, not just with the idea of contamination um, with Earth life when we bring them back, um, which also is a very huge problem. Um, mm-hmm. But also, again, this this massive infrastructure that we have to build and, and spend billions of dollars on to build all the different spacecraft needed to get the sample, send it into orbit, collect it, bring it back to Earth, and, and then we can start analyzing it. Um, all of that said, though, there still is a lot to be said for what we can do on Earth compared to Mars. So, for instance, a lot of my own personal research was done using synchrotrons. Uh, these are you know, multi-billion dollars, sometimes even trillion dollar uh, particle accelerators that fill not just a very small building, they, they fill an extremely large building. In the case of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, you know, it, it covers you know, across an, an international boundary. Um, most of the synchrotrons that I used um, for my research and, and doing geological analyses um, were smaller. I could walk around the whole ring in maybe 15 minutes or so, so maybe like a mile. Um, but even then, th- that's our very large instruments. We're not taking those to Mars. Um, even if we build a laboratory on Mars, we're still kind of stuck with some of the, the lower resolution instrumentation that we can get there for humans to use. So I think we can do a lot with humans on Mars. But even then, if we send humans to Mars with a laboratory there, when we bring those humans back, they're still going to bring rock samples back with them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're saying send a geologist. That's priority. Absolutely. Got it. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll stay on that topic. Uh, finding life, analyzing samples. Uh, question from Mike Hilton, which Mike, I'm glad you were able to get in. Uh, it's been said that if you want to find life, follow the water. Is there a strategy to find life microbial? Uh, is water the first place to look? It's a very, that's a very good question. And it's a very good strategy um, to start off with what we know. Because if you're looking for something you don't know, then what are you looking for? And the, the true answer is you don't know. Um, so when it comes to looking for life out there, we kind of have to start with, with how life here on earth functions. And as a lot of people know, life on our planet relies on water as a solvent for its chemistry. And it also relies on carbon for its backbone, um, for all the different kinds of molecules, uh, organic chemistry really is the chemistry of carbon. Um, now a lot of us have discussed other possible solvents, things like ammonia, um, you know, carbon dioxide, even uh, supercritical carbon dioxide is a possible solvent for life um, and other possible backbone uh, um, elements like silicon or maybe sulfur or boron. There's, there's other possibilities in both realms. But honestly, I, I have a whole lecture I give on why, why really water is the best, especially for terrestrial worlds like the Earth and Mars uh, and why carbon is also kind of the best, too, based on the chemistry that we understand for how life functions. Um, and so, yeah, following the water is kind of important in looking for life. It's a good place to start. And so that's one reason why looking at Mars, a lot of us started getting very excited when those, those first data came back, showing us that there, there weren't just, you know, the Viking images of showing these channels that looked like water once flowed. But once we started getting high resolution spectroscopy from orbit, showing us that they were hydrated minerals, that the minerals contained water in their structure were likely laid down, during periods of some form of water flow uh, or, or standing water. And now based on our rovers, we've now seen places where there certainly has been standing water for periods of time in the past. It's caused a lot of changes in the mineralogy. Um, that's very exciting for Mars. Um, it tells us a lot about the possibilities for life there. Um, for Venus, for instance, one of the big issues right now for an atmospheric biology in Venus is the water activity is actually very, very low. That means there's extremely little uh, water by itself, and there's there's little uh, chemistry going on involving water in the atmosphere. And so you said uh, you've given a talk about this, uh, specifically about the water. Where can we find that? So Mike Hilton, you can look it up. Where can he find that to represent? Um, I'm not sure actually where that's on- online. So I- I've given that before for the Mars University as a lecture uh, in their intro astrobiology course. I'm always happy to talk with others. So if, if Mike wants to learn more, I'm, I'm happy to sit and chat. Uh, I can share my slides as well. I have a lot of slides on on the chemistry of carbon, the chemistry of water, and why why water is just really cool. Um, honestly, water does a lot of really amazing things, and we should be very thankful that it, it's, it's, it, it works the way it does. Absolutely. All right. Well, stay tuned. We'll, we'll get more about that. Uh, I see another question here from AC. It says, Dr. Lau, the Bennu sample return mission has already shown a high concentration of organic molecular composition. Do you think that there is a possibility that some type of life could exist in asteroids? Fun question. 
um, not just Ben U, but also Ryugu. Um, so these recent sample returns from, from, from both Hayabusa 2 and now from Osiris Rex, um, we're seeing a lot of organic chemistry. Our previous sample returns as well, also our missions to comets, we're seeing organic chemistry on the surface of comets and, and cometary material. That's telling us a lot, not necessarily about life, but that organic chemistry can happen fairly regularly and without life in the, in the cosmos. Um, astrochemists out there are now identifying a, a long list of organic molecules inside of the dust in space and throughout our, our galaxy and elsewhere. Um, and so we now know organic chemistry is, is the name of the game. It happens everywhere. Um, and it's not necessarily a sign of life. It might be an indicator though that some of that organic chemistry brought carbon and brought early precursor molecules for life to earth. It's possible. Um, I don't think life would necessarily be likely inside of asteroids unless there was some method for it to get there from where it originated. I don't see a system where life could originate on asteroids because you have to remember that the asteroids themselves, those are, are primitive materials. They represent either the earliest solid things forming in our solar system or they represent worlds that once were that broke apart and, and were crushed and destroyed through large impacts long ago. And so I, I don't see them being necessarily a good place to look for life. But I'm also always open-minded to possibilities. You guys are crushing it with the questions today. I love these. Uh, qu another question here from from Mark. What is uh, possibly restoring the Venus atmosphere? And second question, if you could choose floating city in Venus atmosphere or a Martian crater city. Okay. Um, so when it comes to the Venusian atmosphere, it's not necessarily what's replenishing it. There, there is a small amount being stripped away all the time. Um, one of the reasons we think that Venus might have had oceans, likely had oceans early on, is because of its atmosphere. Um, like I said, it's 92 times the surface pressure at the surface than what we have here on Earth. Its atmosphere is also very thick. Uh, so there's a lot of atmosphere there, way more than what we have just in, in concentration of, of molecules alone. Uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, Venus has a very, very thick atmosphere. It's part of why if you look at, at, uh, at Venus using uh, uh, visible light, what we see with our own eyes, you actually cannot see the surface of Venus. We've never seen the surface of Venus from the outside with, uh, with visible imagery. We've only seen the surface in visible imagery from the Venera landers. Um, otherwise, we have to use radio. We have to, have to use radar to look at the surface and see the structure of the rocks and things like that because that atmosphere is so very thick. And so it doesn't actually require a method of being replenished um, to still be extremely abundant like it is. That said, we do know that there has been recent volcanism on Venus. Uh, some recent data actually just came out showing that the Magellan uh, spacecraft had found signs of, of volcanism happening in the Venusian atmosphere, replenishing it, throwing some stuff up there. So uh, there's a lot to learn there. And I apologize, my child is having a blast over here in my, in my office, so. We get um, it. The second get question it. was, if yeah, you could yeah, choose. Sorry, I didn't realize it was it was two questions. Yeah, second one, if you could choose floating city in Venus atmosphere or Mars crater city. Oh, interesting. I'd, I'd have to go with Mars crater city, even though I love the idea of having a floating city on Venus, like a Bespin cloud city from Star Wars. Having that on Venus would be very cool. There was a, a concept design some years ago called Havoc. It was the high altitude Venusian orbital something i forget um but anyway it's an acronym um it was a very cool idea though of having spacecraft that could like kind of land in the atmosphere connect to these floating platforms have astronauts do work and then take back off again um it's very cool and i would love to see it happen it'd be it's just not where we are right now technologically and it would be a very massive undertaking and even then i don't see as much of a science reward from sending humans to the atmosphere of venus outside of the sheer beauty of exploration uh, Venus is a place where I, I can see us doing a lot more with robots, whereas Mars, Mars is a place where we know we can send humans now. We know that we, we can set up, you know, a very beautiful city on the surface of Mars. We can start doing a lot of really cool research. Um, there's so much we could do with humans on Mars, so I, I have to go for Mars. Um, and, and not just a crater. I love the idea of using a lava tube as well, because then you have a structure underground. So when, when lava flows underground, uh, it can leave behind these long tubes, these long pockets of open space, and we know they exist on Mars. We, we have uh, imagery from orbit looking down. We see openings into the roofs of some of these, these lava tubes that have collapsed in or have openings. And so we know there are openings where we could actually put human 
spaces inside of some of these lava tubes that would save us from having to build the structure out around and, and protect ourselves from radiation. It's already there as a cave. So I think it'd be pretty cool if we could do that. I agree with you on that one. I'm going I'm to take your word for it. Uh, well, we've talked about Mars, Saturn, Venus, Enceladus. We've gone all over the place. Uh, so let's focus on Graham. So as I mentioned um, in the introduction, you also serve as the director of logistics for the Mars Society's University Rover Challenge. How did you get involved uh, in the student challenge? And uh, what has been your experience in helping manage? Yeah, um, so I started in 2012, I wanna say now, it's been some years. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Ryan Kobrick, uh, who currently works for Blue Origin, but previously has been an analog astronaut. He was uh, one of the first to go to FMARS, uh, run by the Mars Society up in the Arctic. That's the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station. Uh, he was on several missions at, at MDRS, the Mars Desert Research Station. Um, he and I were both in graduate school at the University of Colorado in Boulder uh, here in Colorado. Uh, and we were invited by the director of the URC, Kevin Sloan, to go out and help volunteer to staff this event. Um, and my, my very first time out, I was super excited to see like these rovers and young students. And I think my, my first year, I wanna say we had like maybe 10, maybe 10 teams um, and they were, you know, kind of small and the, the rovers were, you know, they had a lot of issues and stuff. They were all like super enthusiastic. And, and now, you know, I, over the years it's grown. Now we start off usually around a hundred teams register. Uh, we have a, a two down selection processes there's a preliminary design review where they show us that they're working on a rover. Then we have a systems acceptance review that is you know, really a full, a full scale engineering review for them to show us that their, their systems are ready to go. The rover is ready to go. They have the funding, the testing, the team is ready to go. Um, and in the end, we usually have like 24 to 36 teams or so who come out to the Mars Desert Research Station in Hanksville, Utah at the end of May and early June. And we put them through their paces uh, with an extremely hard competition. The challenge is um, I've seen other robotics competitions and I think the URC is easily the most challenging. Uh, there are places where the rovers might have to drive up to a kilometer away, driving outside of comms range. Um, we've had all, autonomous tasks and things like that for them. Um, it's been very fun for me over the years to see uh, the growth of, of the challenge, to see how things have changed, to see the rovers being built, the teams working together. It's just, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I, I got to interview uh, a group in 2023 um, that had been at URC and, and showcased um, their rover. It was really cool to talk to them and, and hear about their experience and, and how they were so excited about it. Um, I, I do have a standing invitation from Kevin to come out, so maybe uh, we'll make it out this year. Um, but also, in addition to being uh, director of logistics for URC, uh, I mentioned before, again, in your bio that you also serve as research investigator and... Director of Communications for Blue Marble Space. Um, tell us, what is Blue Marble? What is its mission, its purpose, and how do you support those endeavors? Sure. Blue Marble Space was founded in 2009 by my colleague and the CEO of our organization, Sanjoy Sam, initially as his vision that astronauts, when they go to space, shouldn't be carrying just a flag of the Earth, of America or of Russia or China. It should be a flag of the Earth, a flag that represents all of us together in space. And so he had this idea of one flag in space as an initiative for us to share together. Hold on one moment. No one wants to say hi. Um, yeah, my, my son does love talking um, just as much as I do, apparently. Um, but yeah, so from Blue Marble Space was born this idea um, of having a, a nonprofit organization focused on this vision of the earth in space, of our oneness, togetherness in space. And from that, we had we have several initiatives now that have been born out of that, like Saganet, our, our social networking platform originally for astrobiology. Now it's the place where we host Ask an Astrobiologist. We had Green Space, our microgreen growing farm in Pennsylvania, SciWorthy, where we write about current science research going on. Um, and then we also have our research institution, uh, BMSIS, which now has over 70 research affiliates, uh, 60 visiting scholars, and every summer we have a large number of interns who work for us as well. Okay, so you've got a lot of interns. I remember, um, you know, when I was, again, doing my research before our, our conversation, I was excited to see what it was that you were doing. And I know that we have uh, some students watching us today who are interested in astrobiology. Uh, do you have any 
program recommendations or advice for them as they're exploring uh, the next steps in their career? Yeah, I, I probably spend a solid couple of hours every week speaking to students directly through Zoom meetings and, and Google Meet and also just talking on Reddit and Twitter, now X and Instagram and LinkedIn and all these things. There's a lot of people who want to be involved in astrobiology and space exploration. They're looking for opportunities. I will say for undergraduate students, uh, those working on associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, or joint bachelor's, master's degrees, uh, or those who have finished a bachelor's degree or associate's degree, but haven't yet started a graduate program, uh, if they're looking for an internship, we have a summer internship called the Young Scientist Program. I'm the director of that program as well. Um, it's honestly, it's the flagship, I think, of our programs for students. Uh, it's a June through August program where the students work with a, a number of us, uh, but they have one of us as their research mentor on a project. They also learn from myself and, and other experts in the field about science communication. They also learn about moral philosophy and ethical frameworks that we use in moral philosophy to understand how humans have figured out what is right and wrong through time? How, how do we address right and wrong from a variety of perspectives? Um, because those are important for us to know when it comes to things like, should we be going to Mars to explore? That's a moral question just as much as it is a human or a scientific question. Um, should we be sending people into space at all? Uh, what should we do to future humans on Mars? Should we change humans by genetically engineering ourselves? These are big questions. So interns in our program get a chance to ask those questions. They learn about the value um, of science communication, how to speak and write and present about their research, both to sci scientific groups, but also to the public, to communities that they're part of. Um, and then they also do research with us. And there's a lot of different projects. We've had projects, everything from um, the future of Mars exploration to um, how uh, radiation affects astronauts on the ISS, to the, the history of water uh, chemically on the earth and in other places. I have projects on science communication, um, I've had projects that are involved in looking for biosignatures and helping us build a database of biosignatures. Um, a bunch of really cool things out there for students uh, to, to be involved in. Um, if there are people who are watching who are maybe uh, currently in a master's program or a PhD program or have finished a master's or PhD, uh, we also have our visiting scholars program. Um, that's not an internship. It's, it's more like an externship. It's where you join us, uh, you work with one of us for a year or more and usually on one or even more projects. Uh, and so through those projects, then you can kind of develop your own expertise and you can get involved in publishing, presenting at conferences and stuff with us. Okay, so say you're not a student. Say you're an adult uh, like myself. I'm a non-scientist, non-engineer, uh, but have a desire to, to learn and to be a part of the conversation. Do you have any recommendations for those that wanna learn more about astrobiology? Where should they start besides watching ask, ask an astrobiologist yeah i mean the show obviously is the best place to start obviously um, but the, the nasa astrobiology program has a really lovely website uh astrobiology.nasa.gov there's a lot of really cool stuff there uh, not just a link to my show but lots of great educational materials we have the astrobiology graphic histories which are comic books about astrobiology um, there's a lot of resources for learning about astrobiology job opportunities um, there's articles that are published about current events, um, people who are doing work in the field, uh, different field sites in general. Um, there's also a link to the website there to the Astrobiology Primers. Uh, the Astrobiology Primers started off many years ago. Uh, it's now working through its third rendition. The first rendition was a short paper that was written by a few graduate students to help other graduate students learn about the general language of all these different fields. Um, astrobiology is not a discipline of science or engineering. Astrobiology is a field of human study that includes things like biology and chemistry and astrophysics and philosophy and communication and all these other things. And so to really be a good astrobiologist, you kind of have to have some level of knowledge of all the language that's used in these different fields, at least some of the general jargon from these different fields. So the primer started off kind of helping people to kind of access the very basic intro level information. Uh, in its second rendition, it, it, it's, it was striving to do that, but then even more, to really give new students, undergraduate and graduate, a full breadth of knowledge of what astrobiology is. And now the third edition, which has not been released yet, but it's coming out very soon, and has been worked on by a large number of early career researchers, uh, will really kind of be like the place to go for 
a really nice intro level, but also deep dive into mm -hmm. astrobiology. And so I, I highly recommend the astrobiology primers. Uh, they're worthy of checking out. There's also just a lot of great books too. If you love reading like I do, uh, I have people on the show regularly who, who publish books in astrobiology. You know, Adam Frank has his little book of aliens. Kevin Hand wrote Alien Oceans. Uh, there's a bunch of great books out there that introduce you to a lot of topics and aspects of astrobiology. Mm -hmm. So speaking of, you know, introdu introduction of these topics uh, to people, you know, part of your, your role is obviously working within your field. You work with students who are uh, on their career path. Uh, but part of your role is also to share science information with the general public and for people that don't necessarily have that background or the, the potential understanding. So Astrobiology Primer is a great place to start. Um, but as the interest in public, or excuse me, the public interest in space exploration grows, um, you know, how do you see your role as a communications person slash astrobiologist in communicating that complex scientific information uh, to the public and get them excited and interested in all of these various projects and these missions? And, and why is that important? Yeah, there are, are two things that really drove me towards science communication originally. One of them is that you know I was always that person that I, I love just talking to people like around a campfire with some whiskey, you know, or like looking at the stars together or out hiking on a trail, um, just talking about what our universe is, where we are in the cosmos, what we know about life, what we know about science. Um, those sharing conversations meant so much for me. So I realized I was good at talking and I was good at sharing. Um, I have one moment again. Um, you have to love little ones. Um, and so the other side of science communication for me was really trying to make sure we get things right. There is so much misinformation um, uh, and disinformation out there. there. There's not just people not knowing things. There are people who stand to benefit from others not knowing things and blatantly not knowing things. Um, there's a lot of interest groups in this planet that have fared very well and have become very prosperous and brought wealth to certain individuals through the sheer act of keeping people ignorant to what we know. And, and I, I've always found that to be a threat. Um, you know, Carl Sagan once wrote of science as a candle in the dark. It is really not only how we've developed all of our technology, our knowledge of where we are right now, how we've sent people into space and to the moon, how we built our smartphones, our computer systems that let us talk across the planet and watch YouTube videos, you know, all those people taking TikTok videos of themselves all the time, that's all thanks to science. Um, and so there's a lot we have to be thankful for. Um, again, as Carl Sagan once said, um, we live in this society that is exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which almost no one knows anything about science and technology. And that is a threat to our lifestyle and our future. Um, especially, you know, right now is a great time that we can look around our world. We see things like wildfires, climate change, you know, is driving a lot more changes in the, the intensity, variability of storms. Uh, there's a lot to worry about right now with human populations, with refugees being forced to migrate across our planet, seeking out fresh water and, and resources to survive. Um, there's a dangerous future ahead of us right now when it comes to things like artificial intelligence and techn technology being used by those who want to use it in a malicious way. And so because of those concerns, I think we need a populace of citizens who are educated about science and technology, engineering, how these things function. And so I, I think, you know, I, I see science communication as a beautiful role where we can have a dialogue and exchange our knowledge, but it's also a role that is almost imperative that if you know something, you almost have to make sure that you are trying your best to effectively share it with others as well. Mm -hmm. I like that. that. That should be a motto for all those scientists communicators, space communicators out there, uh, if you have the knowledge, you should share it. Um, speaking of knowledge and sharing it, uh, we have another question from Astrobiology Academy, and this is great. This leads into my last question as well. How do you think humans globally would react upon alien detection? Cool. Um, I have a hope and a worry. Now, okay. you, you watch like movies, you watch Contact, uh, based mm -hmm. on a Carl Sagan novel. I, I guess I, I have to mention Sagan over and over again. It's just required in astrobiology. But if you watch the film Contact, it presents what might happen if you know certain uh, religious groups are, are concerned, scared of alien detection. 
Um, you watch other films and TV shows and like people are screaming and running for their lives, you know, and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the Vogons show up and they're going to destroy the planet and people are running and screaming. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, and so here's my, my concern. I'm very worried that a lot of people won't care. Um, I'm very concerned that we might even have a really significant detection, an actual signal with alien life or something like that, and, and people just won't pay attention. Um, and there's, there's two reasons I worry about that. One is the past. Uh, so there was a period of time here in the West, especially in the U.S., uh, roughly from the late 1800s, around 1895, when Percival Lowell published the book Mars uh, and presented this idea of aliens surviving on Mars and irrigating water from the poles to the equator, um, which drove H.G. Wells two years later to write The War of the Worlds. Um, from roughly that time period uh, in the U.K., here in the U.S., a lot of people just assumed there were aliens out there. It was a well-known fact. There are aliens on Mars. There's life on Mars. Venus has aliens. If you watch old science fiction films in the 1920s, 20s, and 30s, and 40s, it, it, they weren't saying, oh, maybe there's aliens. They were saying, there are aliens. Here they are. They're humanoids. They're walking around. They're doing these things. Um, people really thought that Mars especially was inhabited by an advanced race of other beings, and it didn't really matter to most people. It was just, yeah, they're there. We know they're there. So what? Um, people were kind of blasé about this, this idea that there was life on Mars. And it wasn't until the Mariner spacecraft that we learned that Mars's surface looks rather barren. And then with the Viking spacecraft, we, we found out it doesn't look like there's any advanced civilizations there at all. Um, and so my concern is that people won't care because it'll seem like, oh, we know that. So what? We have to go. We have to go to work. We have to go do these other things. Um, we also see right now in our 24-hour news cycle, we are we are being just bombarded, overwhelmed constantly by news, by by this this feeling we have to update our feeds and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. We have to we have to get the new thing, the fresh thing every day. And it's interesting because if you start asking people about news topics that happened not only like a year or two ago or a few months ago, even a few weeks ago. If you start bringing up news topics from a few weeks ago, most people have already forgotten what happened. We are being overwhelmed by this drive to have new information to the point that we're not even paying attention to other things in recency, let alone great you know, writings of history and our knowledge of the past and, and what we could look for in our possible futures. And so I, I'm worried about that. I'm worried that people just won't care and that it'll fall away from the 24 hour news cycle and then people will just go about their days and it'll be nothing. However, I also have a hope. My hope is that a detection could also drive us to finally want to unify and identify ourselves, not as Americans, not as you know, Russians, Chinese, not as Koreans, but as, as humans. Humans, Earthlings, from the planet Earth together, we're in this thing together, and there is someone else out there. If we could come as far as to have that realization, it would be pretty huge for what we could do for our future for everyone. We could certainly still have our individual cultures, our individual nations, our own ideals about what's right and wrong and things like that, but it would give us some kind of identity as a planet. And I, I think we really, really need that now more than ever if we're going to start actually fixing some of these problems that we've created for ourselves. I like your perspective on that. I think that resonates with a lot of people. Um, yeah, there is some worry that people just won't care, won't react. You see it in in movies, uh, you see it on TV, you see it on Instagram, TikTok, whatever. Just be like, okay, yeah, well, not not too surprising there. Um, so yeah, we have to to cling to that hope a little bit, and I think that will uh, be a good segue to to our last question because we're just about at time. Uh, this is from Marash. The question is, are we alone? What do you think? Yeah, um, those who heard me speak on this before know that I I love to point out that scientifically logically, we have to admit that we could be alone. Based on our current knowledge, based on our current evidence, there is some probability right now that is non-zero that we are alone. And that idea is, is terrifying, um, but also it could be important. If we are alone, then we really, I think, have an imperative to go to Mars now and to go out there into the solar system, the galaxy, the universe, and start spreading life, if anything. Um, but if you start looking 
just at the sheer, and look, look at our galaxy alone, the sheer number of stars that we know to exist, something in the 100 billion, maybe even 400 billion realm. Uh, we now know that, that most stars have more than one planet based on current data. And I personally think we're actually underestimating that by a lot. I would guess that most stars have on average 10 or 100 planets or more, like it must it's probably a very large number. Um, and so when we start looking at those numbers, that means there could be a trillion or more planets in our galaxy. There's so many possible worlds. And then if you start thinking about, you know, what, what does life need? Um, if it needs just an Earth-like environment, cer certainly there are going to be other Earth-like worlds out there. Certainly we're going to find other worlds that have oceans and have plate tectonics. So what other things might life need? There, there might be a likelihood that, that life is common amongst some very small fraction of worlds. But given the number of worlds, that means it's a lot of worlds that could have life. And so the optimist in me, the human in me, feels like we can't be alone, that there must be someone else or something else out there. And part of what's driven me to astrobiology in my life is my love of science fiction, of, of nerding out over this possibility that maybe there is something else. And if it is out there, what is it like? And what will it do to us when we find it? I'm going to have to resonate uh, with you on that one as well. Yes, that we have to have hope that, that there is. I mean, there's always the chance that we are alone, but hanging on to that hope um, that there might be. And if there isn't, are we going to be the ones that become interplanetary and, and, and spread that that life throughout the universe. I think that is a good place to stop. That gives everybody something to think about uh, as we wrap things up. I uh, want to say just thank you so much, uh, Dr. Graham, for being here today. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. I know that we had a lot of uh, good questions from the audience, so thank you for uh, tackling all of those like a champ. Appreciate um, your, your time and being here with us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. You guys crushed it with the questions today. Uh, as a reminder, after today's uh, live broadcast, everything will be posted online. So check it out on Spotify, YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, all the places that you get your podcast. Uh, we will be streaming there. So let's wrap up today. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. As you have heard me say for the last year, the best is yet to come. Bye, everybody. <laughs>